Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of fish images uh, and trying to predict the species of fish based on the image. So we have nine different species. Um, you can see them all here. And we're going to try to predict what uh, species a given image is. Now we have two types of folders. One st uh, is GT, which stands for ground truth. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference is. I couldn't really figure out here. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure what it means by ground truth images uh, because the labels are provided for both the regular images and these GT images. But it looks like maybe the GT images are, are a different file size. Uh, less less uh, memory. So I don't really know what it is. Um, we're just not going to use the GT images. We're going to use all of the class uh, images uh, without GT. So let's uh, hop into the notebook. Um, and we're going to use NumPy and Pandas for working with the data, getting the images into a data frame. And then we'll use the path object from pathlib and the os.path library uh, for also, I guess I should put these together for working with the data. For pre processing, uh, we're just going to do the train test split using this function from sklearn. And we'll do all of the loading in the data and the model building using TensorFlow. So let's go ahead and import all of that. And we'll load in, well, actually, we want to set the image directory. We just want a string that's going to bring us to where the images are stored. So uh, we should be looking for the folder that contains the class folders, uh, which is here, this fish data set folder. Each one of these has class folders. And you'll notice within each class folder, there's two class folders. But uh, don't worry about that. We'll deal with that as we get to it. So let's copy the file path to this fish data set folder here and paste it in there. Now, um, I don't just want it as a string. Um, it'd be much more useful to have it as a path object. So I'm going to cast the string into a path object uh, so that we can actually do searches within the directory for files. So let's say creating a uh, or create file, I'll say creating file data frame. So uh, you may have seen me do this before. We're going to use the flow from data frame function from the uh, Keras image data generator. Um, and that requires that we have a data frame that has two columns, one which uh, contains the file paths to the images and the other column which contains the labels for each image. So. Uh, we're going to get the file paths and labels separately. We'll start with the file paths since it's simpler. Uh, to do that, we're going to take our image dir, which is a pathlib path object. And the path object has a nice function called glob, which allows us to search for patterns within the directory. So we're going to find anything followed by something.png. And uh, we can verify that all of the images are in PNG format. So this should return a generator, uh, which will provide us with all the file paths to every PNG file within uh, any subdirectory of our image dir. So the double star means you can go through directories too. Uh, and I'm just going to turn the, the generator into a list to actually generate all of those file paths for us. And it will generate them as POSIX paths, uh, so as al also as path, path objects from pathlib. And here we go. So let's call this file paths. File paths is a list of all of the file paths to, every, to each image. I'll just say get file paths. And then we're also going to get the labels. Now to get the labels, we're going to actually take file paths. And if you notice, uh, the last, f the, the, the parent folder of every image uh, is the label. So we want to get this value. Um, and there are two ways we could do this because we know we have this GT problem. Uh, if we look back into our, our uh, directory tree here, e the images, uh, we don't want the GT images. So there's two folders. So you'll notice that both the GT and the original are in this uh, original file. So we could try to get the file path from this name, or we could try to get it from this name. So I think what I'll do is just get it from the parent directory and then I'll drop all of the GT examples. So 
we can map a function to this to these paths. So file paths is a list. Let's map a function to the list using the map uh, map function from Python, and this allows us to map a lambda function or any other function to file paths. Now the lambda function we're using for a given x, so x here would be one of these paths. For a given x, we're going to uh, apply some transformation that should hopefully return just this value. So to do that, uh, if we look at one of these, for example, uh, let's not use POSIX path, let's just use it as a string. Um, there's a nice function from os.path called os.path.split, and you can use this on POSIX paths or strings, it doesn't matter, os.path.split uh, pass in the string, and it will split off the file name from the rest of the path. We can then just index at zero to drop the file name. Now you'll notice that we have uh, the we, we could split again to get this parent directory. So let's do that. We'll do os.path.split on this thing, and that will split off the label name from the rest of the file path. So now we index at one, and we just get the label name. So I want to apply this to the list. So instead of just passing in a string, let's do that for any arbitrary x and put that in as the output of our lambda function. So for some x, which would be one of these paths, we will get back the label for that x. And we're going to apply that map to file paths. Then we'll turn the map object into a list again, and this should be the list of labels. So there we go. So let's call this labels. Put it up here. Now, um, they're currently lists, and I do want this as a data frame, so I'm going to convert them each individually as, into series, pandas series. So file paths equals pandas dot series of file paths, and we'll give it a name. This will be file path, and labels uh, will be pandas dot series of labels. The name is label. Now the order is still preserved between these, so if we just concatenate them now, the uh, file paths will be matched up to their respective labels. Uh, however, I do want to turn the file path series into a string series, so as type string, uh, because TensorFlow will give us some problems if we pass in path objects um, in the data frame. So after we've converted them to a series, we're going to concatenate file paths and labels. And so we're going to create a, da a data frame, let's call it image DF. And that will be pandas.concat uh, file paths and labels. And we're concatenating along axis 1, which means side by side. So let's run this and take a look at image DF. So here it is. We have the file path and the label for each example. We have 18,000 images. And you'll notice the GT images are still there. So what I'd like to do is filter out the GT images. I'm just going to remove them. So, um, it's a bit interesting. We, there's a few ways we could do this. I think we'll do it with the lambda function. Um, if we take image df sub label, and we can then apply a function to this. For every x, here x is a single one of these labels, which is a string. Uh, we can map x to a missing value, numpy.nan, if the last two characters of x are gt. So if x sub negative 2 to the end equals gt, and otherwise we'll leave it as it is. And that should just send all the gt examples to missing values. So we don't want to just drop these from labels, we want to drop these from the whole data frame. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll apply this function to just the label column. Let's put that up here. We'll say drop gt images. And so here we're, drop, we're turning them into missing values. And you can then see we have missing values there. So then all we have to do is say image df equals image df dot drop na, which will drop any missing values along whichever axis we specify. Here it's axis 0 because we want to drop rows. Uh, so if we run that, you can see we now no longer have GT and our, our the number of examples has gone from 18,000 to 9,000. So half the images are gone. And now we're dealing with the proper images that we want. 
So, um, I think we're almost done. Uh, only thing is, it's we are, we're dealing with quite a few images here uh, for our purposes. Now, I'm not saying uh, we shouldn't use these images, but I'm going to reduce the number of images we're using simply for the purposes of the video so that we don't take 20 minutes to train the model. Um, so what I'm going to do is reduce the number of images. Right now there's a thousand images of each class. I'm just going to reduce that to 200 images of each class. Now one way to do this would be to sample the data frame. So 200 times 9, that's 200 images per class, uh, will give us 1800 examples. But if we look at the value counts of this, uh, actually just the value counts of the label column, to see the class distribution after that, you'll see they're not exactly 200. And I prefer to have the class distribution uh, even uh, so that we don't have to deal with the class imbalance. If you look at the original uh, image DF's class uh, distribution, so remove the sample function, you see it's a thousand of each. So if we just sample like this, we're going to get not exactly 200 of each. And I want to exactly 200 of each. So how can we do this? Um, over here, I'm going to say sample 200 images from each class. Uh, and we're going to do this by creating an empty list called samples. And then we're going to iterate through each uh, label. So for category, in image df sub label dot unique. So for each unique label, that for each unique one of these, there should only be nine of them. <coughs> we're going to call that category. We're going to create a slice called category slice. So it's a slice of our data frame. Uh, that's just image df dot query. So it should be an underscore. Uh, so the query function, um, we can query the data frame uh, by asking if a column meets a certain condition. So we can query all examples where label equals uh, red C bream, for example. That would just give us the red C bream examples. Now, uh, let's say I want, in this case, I want the, uh, here, let's say category equals horse mackerel, I think was the name of one. Let's say, well, I could use, I could just pass in the string like this, and then I get all those examples. But let's say I want to reference it uh, as the environment variable. I use an at sign to, to say, uh, use the Python variable here. And then we can actually just uh, query using an outside variable. So that's what I'm doing in here. I'm going to query all images where label equals at category. And that's going to be our slice. So a slice looks like this. It's all the examples consisting of a, I mean, uh, that have a, a specific class. Then what we'll do is we'll take the category slice and sample from this. So we can ensure that uh, all 200 of these samples are coming from the same class. And we'll include a random state so that we can reproduce the results. That should be sample, not samples. Um, and then we're going to take this sample and append it to samples, which is this up here, this empty list. So we append this uh, 200, these 200 uh, images from a given category to samples. And at the end of this, after we iterate through all categories, we should have uh, samples should contain nine elements, each of which is a data frame containing 200 images of a given class. Then when we're done, we're going to take samples and concatenate all nine uh, subsets into a single data frame and we'll just overwrite image df here uh, and we'll concatenate samples across axis 0 to put all those different sets of 200 images together on top of each other uh, and we're going to sample this again with a fraction of 1.0 uh, the reason for this is uh, after we concatenate them together the order will be um, It'll just go in order of the unique values, so I want to shuffle the data. And by sampling with a fraction of 100%, we can, without replacement, we're, we're essentially just shuffling the data. So I'll do that and include a random state of 1. And then last step is to reset the index. Uh, and I'll include drop equals true 
to prevent the old indices from becoming a new column. So let's run this um, and take a look at image DF. Here we go. We have 1800 rows. The data has been shuffled, so our labels are all over the place. And if we look at the, uh, the class distribution, so image DF sub label dot value counts, we should see 200 exactly in each class. So we have a balanced class distribution um, and not too many images now. So this is a reasonable amount of images to train on for our purposes. All right, uh, last step is then to do the train test split. So we use the train test split function from sklearn and we'll be splitting image DF into two sets, which would be train and test. We'll specify the train size, we could do it 70%. Shuffle equals true. So we'll shuffle again once before we do the split. And um, because we're shuffling, we'll include a random state. And that will return uh, train DF and test DF. All right, now let's start loading the data, loading the images. Um, so we're going to use image data generator. That's tf.keras.preprocessing.image.image.data.generator. Uh, and the nice thing about using a generator is that we don't have to load all the files in at the same time. So if we tried to load all, a thousand, all 1800 images at once, we'd run out of memory very quickly. So uh, by using a generator, we only load them in one batch at a time. We train on the batch, then we recycle the memory and load in the next batch. So let's call this uh, train generator. And for this task, uh, we're going to be using a pre-trained model. Uh, we're actually going to be using MobileNet. So MobileNet is a pre-trained transfer learning model. Uh, and it was trained on the famous ImageNet dataset. The ImageNet dataset has a thousand different classes of a huge variety of different images. So because this model was exposed to such variety, it's become incredibly good at extracting useful features from any image. And honestly, this is one of the most underrated um, like uh, tools in, in a machine uh, learning engineer's toolkit. Uh, transfer learning is incredibly useful because you have this model that's just been absolutely perfected over um, very long training times and with huge data sets. Um, so the weights are like really, really highly optimized for extracting useful features from images. And the great thing about using these is you don't have to train your own feature extractor. You don't have to train your convolutional layers. You, you load in the convolutional layers that were already trained. They will extract the images. And then you just perform classification on the features that they extract. So um, because, you know, let me just load it. And I guess we'll do this first. Pre-trained model. This is going to be tf.keras.applications uh, dot mobilenet v2, like that. Um, and the input shape. So the default input shape, uh, the, the shape that um, it was originally trained on, was 224 by 224 by 3. And we'll keep it that way, so let's leave that. And we'll set, we have to make sure to set include top equals false. So include top uh, means include the original classification layer, or the output layer, uh, for the original ImageNet dataset. And that means um, we, we, we want to make sure include top is false if we're doing transfer learning because we want to use this model to make our own predictions. So um, we don't want a thousand outputs. We want nine outputs in this case. So include top equals false. But we will include the weights should be the same as the image net weights. Then pooling. Uh, so pooling adds a layer at the top of the model. Um, you can have this set to none, so have no pooling. Um, but by putting average pooling at the end, we can ensure that the output of this feature extractor is a single, oh, a one-dimensional vector, which makes our lives easier. If we just, if we didn't use pooling, if we set this to none or didn't include it, then we'd have to add our own average pooling layer. Um, so we're just going to add that for uh, to make our lives easier. And the last thing we have to do, which is very important, is to set pre-trained model dot trainable to false. 
And this means we're not going to train any of the image net weights. We're going to keep them this, the way they are. We're only going to train the classification uh, portion of the model. So that should load it in. And then um, in our image data generator, this allows us to introduce any transformations to the data. So there's uh, image augmentation if we want, we can pass it in here. Um, I'm not going to do that, but we are going to include a pre-processing function. So this allows us to pass our own custom pre-processing function in. And if we're using a transfer learning model, usually uh, the model will come along with its own pre-processing function to use. In this case, we're going to use tf.keras.applications.mobilenet v2 dot pre process input and so we have to make sure to use the uh, function that comes along with mobile net in our generator so we're also going to include a validation split which will allow us to draw training and validation images from the same generator let's then make a second generator this one will be the test generator the only difference is we don't have a validation split on that one all right, so we'll run that. Now what we're going to do is use our data frame, our two data frames, train and test, uh, to flow images from the data frames into the environment. So we're not actually bringing, loading in the images. We're just sort of um, specifying how the images should be loaded when we do training with these generators. So we're going to use train generator dot flow from direct uh, flow from data frame. And we specify the data frame we'd like to flow from. In this case, it will be train df. It's the one we created earlier. We specify an x column. And this will be uh, the file path column. So that's called file path. And a y column. That will be our label column, which will be called label. Then we specify a target size. So the generator will actually resize the images for us. Um, I believe, I think these, these files, uh, I can't actually see them right now. Kaggle's having an issue loading them, but I don't think they're all the same size. So by specifying a target size, we'll resize the images all to be of size 224 by 224. We then specify the uh, number of color channels using color mode. In this case, it's RGB images, because these are color images. And then our class mode, which will be categorical. So if you're doing multi-class, it should always be categorical. Then we can specify a batch size, uh, so we can specify it here so we don't have to uh, tell the model later when we're doing the fit function. And shuffle equals true. Um, when we're doing training or validation, we definitely want shuffle equals true. And a seed uh, to ensure the shuffle is always done in the same way. And a subset. So subset can either be training or validation, and this parameter only works when you have a validation split. So what we'll do is uh, we will save this in train images. And so train images is sort of the specification for how to flow uh, file paths through the data frame and into our environment. Uh, then we'll make val images. And that's the same thing. Only difference is that the subset becomes validation. So in this case, our subset is training. That means we'll take 80% of the data. And in this case, we are subset as validation. That means we'll take 20% of the data. Last, we'll have our test images. Uh, and this one's a little different. Our, instead of a train generator, we're going to use our test generator. Uh, instead of the train DF data frame, we're going to use the test DF data frame. Uh, and instead, we're not going to have a subset or a seed. And shuffle should be set to false. So since we're only evaluating on test images, we should just sh uh, set shuffle to false. All right, this should load in the images. So we have 1,008 train images, 252 validation, 540 test, and they all belong to nine different classes of fish. OK. So um, load a pre-trained model. We already did this. Now we'll do the training. So we want to construct a classifier that will use the features generated by the pre-trained model to make predictions about which class a fish belongs to. So let's create an input layer. 
And we're not going to create a new input. We already have our input to the model. That would be pre-trained model dot input. So if we look at pre-trained model, maybe just look at a summary of it. It's quite big, I think. Uh, quite a few layers on here. Um, but all the way at the top, uh, we have this input layer. Uh, and if we do pre-trained model dot input, so it's, you can see it's called input one. We then just get the input one uh, input. So we can just use this as our input for the model. Similarly, you could use dot output to get the final average pooling, global average pooling layer uh, that we created using the pooling argument. So we have our inputs, then we want to pass it through a dense layer. So we'll do two dense layers, each one with 128 neurons and a ReLU activation. And instead of passing in inputs here, because uh, that would pass in the output of this particular layer, we want to run through the whole pre-trained model and output the output of the whole pre-trained model. So pre-trained model dot output. Then we'll just copy this over and change the uh, input to this layer to be X. So we're just passing it through. And then the outputs, this is our final classification layer, will also be a dense layer with nine activations, which will correspond to each of the classes, and the softmax activation function. So softmax will give each of these nine values a probability value between zero and one, such that all nine sum to one for a given example. Then we'll construct our model, which will be tf.keras.model. The inputs here will just be given by inputs, and the outputs will be given by outputs. Then we'll compile the model. So we'll use an atom optimizer. For loss, um, we're going to use categorical cross entropy. So not sparse categorical cross entropy. Um, if you look at train images dot labels, uh, here are the label values. But if you actually take a batch, so we take next to get the next batch, um, and then we just take sub one to get the labels from that batch, uh, you can see that they're actually each label is encoded as a vector instead of an integer. So this corresponds to one, this corresponds to zero, zero, uh, eight, or, or uh, yeah, seven. This is eight, eight, eight. Uh, so when you have this one hot encoding of the vec of the uh, labels, you need to use the categorical cross entropy uh, loss function. If you were just passing these in as integers, then when they're converted to vectors, they'll ought to always be sparse, always be one hot. So we can guarantee that they, uh, they will be sparse, and therefore it will, you should use sparse, cr cast, sparse categorical cross entropy. But when we have them as vectors already, there's no guarantee that they're sparse, so we use categorical. All right, for metrics, let's just use accuracy since it's multi-class. And we'll fit the model and store the results in history. Model.fit, train images, that's what we're training on. Our validation data will be val images. Um, we'll specify a number of epochs. So let's train for 100 epochs, which is quite a few, and then use the early stopping callback. That's tf.keras.callbacks dot early stopping. Uh, so this allows us to monitor a value, in this case validation loss, and then set a patience threshold. Let's do three. This is saying uh, look at the validation loss and if it stops improving after three consecutive epochs, stop the training and restore the weights from the best epoch. So restore best weights equals true. All right, um, and this might actually take a bit of time because we're not using GPU acceleration. Now, I think we'll probably get this done faster with it, uh, but you know, it's not necessarily completely necessary. Um, although the forward passes will be slower, the training isn't actually being applied to the, um, the, the convolutional layers. So those are already set in place. 
um, I should have probably done a model dot summary. You can see that which of the parameters are trainable and which are not. In either case, I'll pause this video and return when we finish training. All right, so the training has finished. Um, and now let's just go ahead and quickly get the results. All I'll do here is just uh, store the results in model, uh, I mean store the results in results using model.evaluate on test images. Setting verbose equals zero, so we don't get the loading bar. And then print out, uh, we'll print out the lost and the uh, and the accuracy. So the loss is will display to five decimal places and format with results sub zero. So the first result uh, that we get is the loss and we'll get the second one is the accuracy. So let's just change this to accuracy. Display this one to two decimal places as a percentage. We'll then indent this up and instead of results sub zero we'll do results sub one and multiply it by a hundred so we see it as a percent. Let's just take a moment. Uh, and you can see we have extremely good accuracy, 99% accuracy um, on the test set. Now, I actually tried doing this using the full set of images and not using a pre-trained model, building my own convolutional neural network. I couldn't get more than 86 to 88% accuracy. So by using the pre-trained model, not only do we increase the speeding time, we barely used uh, any of the images. We used like a fifth of the whole data set, but we still have uh, insanely good accuracy. So this is uh, just to show you the power of transfer learning. Um, so that will sum up today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.